Lou Cornicelli, DNR Wildlife Research Manager, thought that after 25 years of rare sightings in the outdoors, nothing could surprise him. When, just when you think you've seen everything, something else comes along. An individual was mushroom hunting down in southeastern Minnesota um, near the town of Freeburg and he came upon this, this two-headed fawn that was dead and he called the local conservation officer. Um, it ended up in a, in a freezer while we tried to figure out what to do with it because it's, it's about as unique as you can get. When Kevin Sears of Reno, Minnesota found the fawn, it looked like it had just been born. It had been licked off by the female. The umbilical had been chewed off, so the, the doe had gone through the whole process of getting the fawn ready to stand up. So she probably um, uh, went through that, that motion of cleaning it off and nudging it with her nose to get it to stand up. It was stillborn at the time, so um, she probably spent a little bit of time with it and then wandered off when she realized it was dead. So it was in about as pristine condition as you could find uh, at that time of year being late May, you know, early June when, fa when fawns are born, it doesn't take very long for either a, a coyote or a dog or a cat to find it um, or to just to deteriorate because of the low warm temperature. So we got pretty lucky. The, the amazing thing is that it, it was carried to term and when, when they did the, the MRI to look at the internal organs, it had one liver, had uh, one set of lungs, but it had two hearts and it had a fully developed skeleton all the way up to the, up to the head. So it's, it's pretty neat but we have seen it in cattle. Uh, the University of Minnesota actually has, um, has a couple of examples, in, in, uh, in, in, I think in cattle and sheep, but not in white-tailed deer. You also have to realize that it probably happens in the wild occasionally, but the, it's a wild animal, so they disappear rather quickly. With a carcass this rare and precious, Lou turned to a reputable taxidermist known for mounting unusual wildlife in realistic settings. Robert Utney, owner of Wild Images in Motion, along with taxidermist Jessica Brooks. It wasn't very difficult to choose uh, Bob and Jessica. I appreciated very much his artistic sense uh, in, in working with this animal. Um, just in general, as you look around in the shop and see the kind of work that he does, it's far more than trophy display. It's really an art form. I've never seen anything like it. and I was actually extremely excited that we were looked at for doing a project as unique as this. I knew it was going to be kind of a once in a lifetime thing and I was just really excited that we were going to get to do it. Robert invited us into his studio to watch them mount the delicate fawn. Basically today we're, we're going to be assembling the animal and doing all the details. Uh, the cast is made from a urethane foam. We have uh, liquid pour foam that we add to it and then we can bend it and manipulate it where we want, staying with the natural anatomy. Each uh, head individually had its own characteristics. One had more of a, a round skull. One had more of like a, a Roman nose almost. Yeah, Roman nose. And one was more slender, one was more stocky, so we wanted to capture the individual um, details of each head, which we thought was pretty interesting. And then along with that, this, the, the, the carcass itself would have no muscle tone, so it, it can't look bulky. It needs to look uh, slim and, and really kind of loose skinned. Yeah, it has almost like a gaunt look to it that if it had been up and moving around, it probably wouldn't have had, so. So we'll be recreating that when we do actually put the skin on. The goal is to make it look dead. Um, so we didn't want it tucked in and holding itself like it would, you know, a newborn fawn, which they'd probably do that almost immediately to lay silent. Um, we wanted some looseness to the body and then also to display both heads um, so it wouldn't look like, you know, they're laying together. It took probably about a day's worth of work to fully alter the form. It took about a day's work of prepping the hide, um, and then the tanning process took a few days. So the prep work actually ends up being a lot more than the time it takes to actually mount the animal itself. What we'll be doing next is removing the heads, um, and then we're gonna get the skin stretched over the body, pin it in place, um, make sure that everything's fitting properly, make sure that the spine and the necks are aligning up properly, We'll start getting the ears filled 
with, uh, we're going to use a two-part resin and um, epoxy clay, which is a self-hardening clay to sculpt the ears. Bob usually does the form altering, and then together we both sort of do the claying process, the sewing. Bob, Bob's going to do the faces. Um, and then, yeah, the rest of it we do together. Um, one person working on one project can't see everything, and we really rely on each other to, you know, catch something the other's going to, uh, could miss. Right now I'm mixing up, it's a two-part epoxy that hardens in about four, well, 12 hours will be rock hard. Uh, this will be for the, uh, the feet or the hooves. Uh, just, it um, ends up being more solid. It's a little bit like sculpting. It's where we know there's gonna be soft, or there should be loose skin, or there's going to be loose skin. We get the main area first, the main area of the body, and then we glue as we go. For each leg, I'll get glued indivi you know, individually. We don't put it on everything. Probably go right there too. When it starts absorbing in the skin, you can't, you can't taxi the skin at some point. You gotta re-wet it. Right now we're, we're just in the process of trying to line everything up and make sure we have that lined up before we start sewing too much. So I'm getting ready to put this foot on. So I fill it with a little bit of um, epoxy clay and then I put a little bit more on here so that I can kind of blend the two together. You're dealing with a, a couple flaps of skin and um, most of my mounds, I think the ears are Im extremely important. They project an attitude and even in this being dead, it's still gonna, it's still key to the overall look. Obviously you wouldn't want them like alert and, and then you have to get the right look. The right thickness and as with anything, it's, every part of it's important, but those, the, to me, that's one of the more difficult areas of any animal, is the ears. Yeah. Or the ear base, just all of it. One of the heads can have a little bit of an open eye, but not much. I'm gonna do that so it, the one that is open is clouded. It's not, you know, it's not a live eye. It has a different, yeah, clouding is probably the best Bit description. Of blue haze. Yep. The finish mount is a work of art, and as far as we know, it's the only two-headed fawn in existence. It's being displayed in wildlife shows, and the DNR will give it a permanent resting place where all can see this rare and precious tiny deer.